my friend. And we are back once again. They haven't gotten rid of us just yet. not really worried about that, are we? Because we know how this story ends. We have the blueprint. We've got the game plan. We know the truth. That's what we're doing here is trying to share it with as many people as will receive it. Unfortunately, we know that many will not receive it. doesn't mean we still don't try to reach as many as possible. That is the function and the purpose of this ministry. To use my own experience and the gifts that God has blessed me with to expose these issues, but to always be centered around gospel of Jesus Christ and make sure that is always preached every time all right okay so we have much much to get to here tonight, so without any further ado, let's go right to the Bible. How about that? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go to verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Now here is a text that is appropriate 
For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Verse 14, and no marvel, which means don't be surprised. Expect this to happen. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing. Once again, don't be surprised. This is something you should expect to see. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, those one third of the fallen angels that he that he brought with him. Don't be surprised. If his ministers also be trans transformed. As the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. What are we being told here? To expect for Satan himself to show up and appear as an angel of light, to impersonate Jesus Christ himself, if possible. And I say if possible because those who are founded in truth use God's word as the foundation for their life and the lens through which they view all things will not be will not be deceived by this false light do not be surprised also if his ministers appear to be ministers of righteousness ministers ministers of good things ministers of good will Satan's minions will appear to be ministers of righteousness. They will appear to be doing good works. How do we know? How do we know if it's from Satan or if it's from God? You have to live with God's word as your foundation. And you can't deviate from it. I want to bring up a as I read an introduction it's not an introduction it's just a, a jacket blurb from this uh, from a book that I have recently found that is really really helpful so I'm going to use this Jacket blurb from this book. Listen, I don't I'm I'm not putting this up here because I get I get I'm I'm not an affiliate. I don't know anything. I don't know how to do that. I'm not worried about that. I just want you to know about this book. And I'm going to use as my introduction, I'm going to use this this blurb, this jacket note as an introduction to this message, to this study. And it says this, humanity has three great desires. Number one, to be as God. Number two, to be masters of meaning and destiny. Number three, to build heaven on earth. The descendants of Cain. We learn in God's word that the descendants of Cain are builders. That They will try to build their version of heaven here on the earth. This book, Game of Gods, by Carl Teichrib, is, is an investigation into the changing nature of Western civilization, a revolutionary replacement of the Judeo-Christian framework with a new yet ancient paradigm. It is a journey into the cracks and crevices of big history, an expedition into the expanding realm of transformational movements and ideas. Forces of change that shift how we think, behave, and relate. A sense of uncertainty and foreboding anticipation is palpable. 
and it's more than just a feeling in the air. We are witnessing a titanic impact at the crossroads of religion, politics, technology, and culture. Fundamentally, it is a collision of worldviews. We are all experiencing the shockwaves. In this book, it says you can step into closed-door meetings at the United Nations, rub shoulders with faith healers, playing politics, scrutinize the religious impulse of technology, and watch how culture becomes a platform for spiritual engineering. A new and dominant mythos emerges. The vision of oneness. One-ism. A reality claim that emanates from beyond time, space, and matter. It is man that's carrying out this principle of this idea of oneness. But it comes from the father of lies, ultimately. From the author of confusion. From politics to transhumanism. Uh, Western culture is quickly turning away from a biblical worldview and embracing a false gospel of oneness. This one world movement is leading toward, if it's not already here, leading toward quickly global occupation and also a new world religion. A new globalist religion. And they tell you exactly what they're planning. Which is a new golden age. Ruled by the gods of old. The ancient gods. Little g. The Judeo-Christian narrative has been abandoned in our politics and culture replaced by a man-centered worldview. The idea that I am God. Where did the contemporary form of this confusion of ideas, confusion of faiths, where did this come from? This, this contemporary what we call today the New Age movement or the New Spirituality or the, the New Thought movement. Is oneness biblical? Let's go back to God's Word. Should we seek to all be one? Sounds good, right? It sounds like the right idea. It's important to remember that we are all made in God's image, and we all share the same flesh, but we do not all follow after the same spirit. We can all fit into the same space because we're made of the same matter, but we do not all follow the same spirit. Luke chapter 12, verse 51. And this is Jesus Christ speaking. Not the Maitreya, not Christ consciousness. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Luke chapter 12, verse 51. Suppose you all that I am come to give peace on earth. Do you think that I have come here to give peace on earth? I tell you, no. Rather, division. Why division? Because we don't all follow after the same spirit. Some of us have taken up the practice of following after the author of confusion. 
For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother and the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Yeah. Show that verse to someone who is engrossed with the New Age movement. Show that verse to someone who is living in the law of attraction. Now, this is a false gospel, and we're gonna we're gonna start here with this particular study identifying where the contemporary form of this false gospel has come from. We, we understand that in years past, in centuries past, pagan religions and pantheistic religions existed, but how did that get here today? Who brought it here today? Well, ultimately we know that that is the work of Satan, that's his job, is to confuse. But who are the people? How can we identify where these things come from? I have links in the description for everything I'm for the for the resources that I'm using here tonight. I've got a link to the to the book Game of God by Carl Teichrib that I've used at the for the introduction. This is an article from Good News About God by Dr. Lorraine Day. And she gives very good introduction to the Theosophical Society. And this article is titled, One World Religion, the Destruction of Christianity by Christians. So-called. The vast majority of Christians, including Christian pastors, And seminary theologians have never heard the names of those who originated and are continuing to promote the one world religion. Names such as Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, Annie Besant, Alice Bailey, and her demon spirit guide, Joao Kuhl, which we'll talk about. Also, Benjamin Cream, who is the the forerunner, he is the John the Baptist, if you will, to what's known as Lord Maitreya, or this Christ that they talk about. When they say Christ, they mean Lord Maitreya. And Benjamin Cream seems to be the forerunner, the one who's out explaining, Maitreya's coming, he's here, he's just waiting to show himself. That's Benjamin Cream's job. Also, the loosest trust formerly the Lucifer Trust, and the Theosophical Society. The word theosophy is a compound Greek word meaning theos, or divine being, a god, and sophia, which means wisdom. Hence, theosophy would mean divine wisdom, wisdom from God, wisdom of God. Which god? That's something that Christians need to get used to doing is testing all things when someone uses the term god which god are you talking about when they say jesus which jesus are you talking about when they say christ which christ are you talking about we cannot we can no longer assume in this world where satan has found his way into the church we can no longer assume we can't assume these things any longer Theosophy is essentially a modern form of pantheism, which is worship of the creation rather than the creator. Modern version of pantheism and Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is an esoteric system of mystical, religious, and philosophical doctrine, stressing knowledge as essential to salvation, viewing matter as evil, and variously combining ideas derived from mythology, ancient Greek, 
ancient Greek philosophy, ancient religions, and eventually, now, today, Christianity. In short, it is a system of salvation by knowledge, rather than salvation through Jesus Christ. Continuing with Dr. Day's article, the new twist is the space alien-like but clearly demonic connection whereby theosophy was delivered to the first human protoplasts. That's their term. The first thinking human beings on earth by highly intelligent spiritual entities from superior spheres. Some actually claim that some of these ascended masters, which are actually demons, have been living on Venus for some 18,000 years and will shortly return. This is not a joke. This is not a joke. New Age spirituality is commonly based on theosophical principles. And I speak to you here today by the grace of God as one who has come out of that system. And I will say more about that as we move on. The Theosophical Society is a worldwide association dedicated to practical realization of the oneness of all life, or pantheism, and to independent spiritual search, Gnosticism. It was founded in New York City in 1875 by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, a Russian Jew by birth, along with Henry Olcott, William Judge, and others. Madame Blavatsky traveled for 20 years in Europe, the Americas, Asia, and the Near East, studying mysticism and occultism, the satanic connection to mysticism and occultism. The one world religion, based on theosophy and Freemasonry, is under the auspices of the United Nations, and its first goal is to bring all the Protestant churches back to the Catholic Church. Ecumenism has done much to hasten this this goal with the signing of agreements such as uh, evangelicals and Catholics together and the agreement between the Catholic Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the ELCA. And I have in the playlists in the One World religion playlists you will see i have uh, videos here talking specifically about the united nations and its its use of a particular faith called the bahai faith as what seems to be their unofficial official religion a faith that purports to accept all religions regardless of of what is worshipped under one roof. Therefore, it seems like the Baha'i faith is either a spinoff or maybe the new form. It could be the new form because Baha'i faith was there with theosophy at the same time, forming at the same time. Simultaneously, the pagan religions are being assembled and encouraged to unify. During his time as leader of the Catholic Church, Pope John Paul II traveled to many countries around the world, encouraging Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, New Agers, and various other pagan religions toward unification. That's that's what ecumenism means, bringing all faiths together regardless, regardless of their doctrine. The way the Catholic Church states it today is, let's don't worry about doctrine. Let's just, we'll let God figure that out when we get there. Now, does that sound like Satan in the Garden of Eden? Has God said, that was his first thing. Has God said to question God's word? Continuing now. Because the churches in America are 501c3 nonprofit uh, corporations, their head is actually the government instead of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the government has the right to order the churches as organizations under government authority 
to promote or to prohibit certain church doctrines, including the promotion of homosexuality, the support of war, the support of a totalitarian government that has degenerated, or that has, I'm sorry, that has denigrated the Constitution. All of these are counter to the Word of God. Therefore, Antichrist. A one world religion is much more easily facilitated or implemented into society when groups of Christians are members of an organized church. We're not talking about don't go to church. That's not what anyone here is saying. We're talking about an organized, capital O, organized under the rules and policies of the federal government. That's what we mean by organized church. The leaders of the government authorized 501c3 church, so-called church, can be manipulated and coerced by their governing body, the state, the following government policy, something that would be virtually impossible if every Christian were worshiping according to God's word. In other words, acting as a body, the body of Christ, independent from government authority. These individuals and entities, given in the first paragraph of this article, should be household names to all Christians. That, that was Madame Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, Annie Besant, Benjamin Cream, Lord Petraea. Christians need to know these names because this is the enemy. They are, have been, and are controlled by our adversary. As the Bible tells us that if we diligently and independently study God's word, God's spirit will lead us into all truth. That's from John chapter 16, verse 13. Unfortunately, almost no Christian has ever heard these names or knows anything about the enormous, sophisticated, satanic deception that is rapidly gaining momentum and eventually will envelop and totally assimilate all organized Christianity. Protestant Christians will first be joined to Catholics, then the Protestant-Catholic combination will be merged with paganism. We already see this. We see Protestant churches taking on uh, neo-pagan practices right in their churches today. Uh, and finally, the entire world will embrace atheism, the beast system, in other words. But the New World Order, Illuminists, knowing that there is a desire in the heart of every person to worship a God will, quick, will quickly provide a God, which will be Satan, masquerading as Lucifer, the light bearer, and the whole world will worship Lucifer as their God. And the same as most Christians don't realize what's coming to their church today, most people who fall under the beast system won't realize who they're worshiping. This exists today. And we know, we've talked about it many times here before, Lucifer is the god of Freemasonry. Jewish mysticism is at the heart of the religion of Freemasonry. There's a quote from uh, Albert Pike. Any of you know that name? 33rd degree Mason, sovereign grand commander of the ancient accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the United States. He says, yes, Lucifer is God. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. And we're not going deeply into the United Nations connections in this video. But probably in the next one or in the next, within the next couple videos, we'll get back to that study as well. What we're doing tonight is we're uncovering, we're talking about these people, Alice Bailey, 
Madame Blavatsky. And we're going to understand from their stories how the Theosophical Society came about, what it stands for. And that's what I've got on the screen is the website for this is the Theosophical Society. And we'll look at their about section. Let's put, well, let's put the Bible back up there. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. As we leave into a study of the Theosophical Society and those who founded it, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. No light in them. Alice Bailey. Again, the links for the resources for this information are in the description. We're using uh, fringepop321.com. Dr. Michael Heiser. That's his website. Also, Good News About God. The Good News About God. The website is Good News About God. Yes. And I also have the, a link to the book, Game of Gods, for you to check out. Alice Ann Bailey was born on June 16th, 1880 in Manchester, England. Let's find, let's, let's get a, uh, since we're talking about Alice Bailey, let's, let's just get a picture of her there for you. Some interesting pictures. So there's Alice Bailey and Madame Blavatsky together. That's a, okay, that one will serve for now. From Manchester, England. She produced 24 books. A prolific writer. There was one female author who was Alice Bailey's contemporary, who was more prolific than Alice Bailey, and that was Ellen G. White. And you can't argue that point. She was more prolific. Twenty-four books from 1922 until, up until the uh, late 1940s. Which, like the works of uh, the Theosophical Society's co-founder, Hel Helena Blavatsky, before her, describe a theosophical worldview. Like Blavatsky, she uh, also claimed to have received her teachings from a master. In other words, these books are channeled. Channeled from... Beyond. In her case, channeled from an entity called Jual Kul, who she would often refer to as the Tibetan or just DK. She claims to only have served as a scribe for her master, who would telepathically dictate the majority of her writings. Aside from her books, she is also remembered for founding an esoteric school in 1923 known as the Arcane School. Her third major accomplishment was the co-founding, along with her husband Foster Bailey, 
of two activities known as world goodwill and triangles. Bailey received religious instruction throughout her childhood as a member of the Anglican Church. Very, very tightly bound to the Catholic Church, even though history history will show that they 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 divided and they war with one another. At at the core, their worship appears almost identical. And she had a penchant for the quote-unquote mystical. Bailey's tendency toward the esoteric was further fueled by her first meeting at age 15 with a mysterious figure who she later came to identify as a master of wisdom. Again, another spirit being, and that was at age 15. So right from the start, this individual was, was being accessed used in a certain way. In 1895, while staying with her aunt in Scotland, Alice had an encounter with a man she later came to know as Coot Humi, or K.H. According to her autobiography, his message for her was that she was to work for him in the world. Doesn't that sound like something that Satan might say, I want you to work for me in the world. Work for me in the world. I will give you all the things your heart desires. She considered him to be a member of the hierarchy of spiritual masters. Uh, Theosophists believe these masters oversee the evolution of humanity through the dissemination of ancient wisdom. So, theosophists essentially believe that there are ascended masters or beings that exist beyond our perception that oversee the evolution of humanity through the dissemination of ancient wisdom. Is it any wonder why the theory of evolution is pushed so hard in public schools today? Bailey also claimed to have experienced a a second significant event during this period of her life. While in the Himalayas, Bailey participated in the annual ceremony performed during the full moon of May. Though details of the actual ceremony remain scant, it seems to have been esoteric in nature and deeply revelatory to the young woman. She claimed to have experienced the truth of reality as a unified divine and living whole. She believed this demonstrated the glory of the Lord. Once again, Christians, when they say Lord, question it. Glory of what Lord? Which Lord? Is this God of the Bible? In this case, it certainly is not. It doesn't fit the description. But when they use the term, many people just accept it to mean one and the same. Bailey's mysticism remained a key influence in her life, but her Christian upbringing had also taught her the importance of caring for the sick and the poor. She therefore decided to join the uh, YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, as a social worker in her early 20s. She would also go on to serve as an evangelist to the British troops who were based in Ireland and India. Now, in about uh, 1915, she first came across the teachings of the the Theosophical Society. I'm building up to do uh, Blavatsky after Alice Bailey, so we'll see the the founding of the Theosophical Society when I get to Blavatsky. So around 1915, Alice Bailey uh, first came across the teachings of the Theosophical Society, specifically the Secret Doctrine by Helena Blavatsky, was particularly influential to Bailey and was the foundation upon which she would receive further instruction from her other master, Joao Kuhl, the Tibetan. 
He appeared to her for the first time in 1919 and solidified in her mind everything that she had imbibed through the writings of Blavatsky and Annie Besant, another theosophical writer. This meeting was to begin what Alice described as a collaboration with Bailey, serving as a channel or a tool for Joal Cool from 1922 until the latter part of the 1940s. So all of the books during the time that she was prolific as, as an author, as a writer, it was, this is the time when she was most heavily influenced by this spirit being. Whom followers of Jesus Christ would quickly be able to identify as the author of confusion. Um, the minion spirits of the dragon, Satan himself. The world view she inherited from her master portrayed a cosmos which was ordered in accordance to the plan of God. Which God? God's laws were causal or karma and involved continual rebirth or reincarnation. See, this is not God of Isaac. Abraham and Jacob, this is a different God. This is some other deity that only exists in the minds of men and women. Planted there by the author of confusion. Humanity had an important role to play in the so-called divine plan, and their development was overseen by hierarchy of spiritual leaders who were led by the Christ. Once again, the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Mashiach. We don't know, other than the fact that we know that their so-called Christ is this Lord Maitreya, who Benjamin Cream has prepared uh, most of the world for, this is not Jesus Christ. This is not our Lord and Savior. This is another one, some, some other one. Bailey's uh, writing called A Treatise on Cosmic Fire from 1925 describes a cosmology which closely resembles the oneness of reality or parabrom or parabrom as described by Helena Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine. Bailey also built upon Blavatsky's concept of the seven rays. The seven rays form the manifested logos, the expression of one true divine self. She defines the, she defines the rays as a name for a particular force or type of energy with the emphasis upon the quality which that force exhibits and not upon the form aspect which it creates. Yeah. The seven rays which uh, originate in the mind of God or the boundless immutable principle that's not found anywhere in the Old Testament, is it? Trickle their way down through all of reality, evolving and establishing different layers of existence from the larger macrocosms to the smallest microcosm according to the divine plan. The seven rays concept has become foundational to new age thinking today and continues to play an important role in the movement right now. I was quite familiar with that idea. Now, Alice Bailey was also, in her own right, a founder of various organizations. Bailey claimed to have channeled a form, uh, claimed to have channeled her teachings from her master, Joash Cool, or DK, in order to publish these doctrines. Alice and her husband, Foster, founded the Lucis Trust in 1922, a publishing company for her writings. Bailey's brand of theosophy was also disseminated through the Arcane School, which was established for the purpose of training adult disciples. 
disciples of Lucifer. That's that's not hidden. That's just that's just there. Not you don't you don't have to dig far to understand that they're training disciples of the light bearer, Lucifer, the light which is dark, the false light, Isaiah eight twenty. Second Corinthians chapter eleven verse thirteen through fifteen. Bailey's stated aim for the school, according to her unfinished autobiography, was to teach the truth about the kingdom of God, which she believed was the spiritual hierarchy of our planet, the hierarchy which is currently present in the spiritual realm, has overseen the evolution of humanity through a progressive series of revelations. Humanity has the possibility of joining in with this divine plan, which will eventually see the spiritual hierarchy materialize on earth. This is also called, also known as the externalization of the hierarchy. When these spiritual, when these ascended masters come into the physical realm to run their show, to do their thing. These, these poor people are pitifully deceived the school teaches that humanity may approach and eventually enter this hierarchy in other words you can become an ascended master fundamental to the vision and teachings of the arcane school is the rejection of all theological dogma that is, except for the one they teach, the one they put forth. Rejection of all theological dogma, sects, sects, S-E-C-T-S, and political ideologies. The quote-unquote ageless wisdom is international and transcends while embracing all religions, as it is the foundation of all previous revelation of God taught throughout history. So according to them, your Bible, Word of God, came through these ascended masters. That's how you received it, according to them. We know, especially through the book of Acts, that the Word of God came to us through the Holy Spirit, through that Elements of the Godhead. But according to them, it's ascended masters. It's individuals who so perfected their experience in the flesh or so perfected their spirit that they have ascended to a position where they're in charge now. They're in charge of of developing humanity from, you know, beyond the realm of perception. A key principle taught by the arcane school is the oneness of all humanity. God transcendent is also imminent. And there is the same spark of divine life within all people. So there you go. That's the essential teaching is that God lives inside you. You don't need to do anything. You already are God, Shirley MacLaine. See, that's how, that's how this deception works. It purports to give all the power back to the flesh. So this was followed by the founding of two organizations which were to channel activity. One known as, as we said before, the World Goodwill, originally called the Men of Goodwill, founded in 1932 to promote the brotherhood of all peoples, regardless of race, religion, or political ideology. And then also in 1937, an organization called Triangles, which was based on linking together groups of three people who would creatively meditate together on a daily basis. The networking principle behind triangles was not only 
motivated by a desire to promote personal relationships based around a shared will of good or will to good or goodwill, but was also designed to encourage regular creative meditation. If you've heard anyone say that you can create your reality, you can create your own reality, and you do this when you meditate and you you focus on whatever it is you want to manifest into your world. That's that's where this comes from. That's where this new age idea, this lie comes from. And I call it a lie because I lived it. I was in there doing that thing. Bailey's anticipation of what she described as the new age, which is a term that people within it today don't necessarily like to use. I wasn't very fond of the term myself. Uh, I didn't like to be associated with new age. I was, I was working with, I was working with with energies and spirits in a in a, in, a, in a magical tradition, more of a. I was uh, a Rosicrucian system, a hermetic system. And if you're a Christian and you don't know what that is, God bless you. You, you. you don't need to worry about what that is. That's not important. That is That is lies. That is utter lies. When someone says they're doing magical rituals, someone says that they're they're harnessing energy and controlling spirits, that's a lie. You're making yourself available to spirits they will give you what you want it works these things work these rituals these practices work but they work up into a point to convince you that you can have whatever you want that you can manifest your reality and then at a certain point you'll come to realize that you've been lied to. Maybe you're too deep. Maybe you don't know that there is a Jesus Christ that, that is an advocate before the creator of the universe that will save you from it. Thank God that was me. But there are many who, who don't come to that knowledge. I can say that I was seeking truth in, in such a profound way because I, I, was, I was despondent with life and the world and the way things looked. So I was seeking truth in a way that I was willing to tear everything down. I, wanted, I, I was okay with tearing every piece of my life down to the ground in order to find one shred of real truth, which made me vulnerable to these occult practices because they claim to give you the power. They claim to tell you that you've forgotten who you were, that we've all forgotten our power, that the God lives inside of us. And that's seductive, very seductive when you've come to a point when you're just going to tear your entire world down to the ground and start over. That seems like, that seems like a good idea. Fortunately, by the grace of God, I was not left there. I was able to see that through creating rituals, Rosicrucians will use, Freemasons, Jewish mysticism will use the Bible to write rituals, to create rituals. But if you're paying attention, you'll find out that what's going on is an inversion of the Bible, where the serpent in the garden is the hero. And it was long about that time, as when I was studying uh, Kabbalah and the art of self, Kabbalah magic and the art of self transformation, where the Bible is used in a certain way to create energy and emotion. It was at that point where I recognized this is an inversion 
of the scripture. Why are they inverting the scripture was the question that came. That was the Holy Spirit. It's not me. I can't take any credit for any, any of that. The Holy Spirit showed me this is upside down. And you're walking straight into hell by doing this. Does it feel good to be a magician? It's going to feel really good when you're burning hell as a magician. That's not really, not really what I'm, that got my attention. That was the Holy Spirit working. I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit at the time. Now I know that was the Holy Spirit working in me, pulling on my heart. So anyone out there who is involved with Harry Potter, you just want to do a little manifesting. Just remember, you're toying with Satan. That's his realm. That's what he does. He likes to deceive people into believing that they have the power, that you can create something. Okay, so that's Alice Bailey. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Let's talk about Madame Blavatsky. Before we do, let's let's go back to God's word for just a moment here and recalibrate our minds because because wow. Go to Proverbs. Proverbs 14. Let's go down to verse 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. And the end of that mirth is heaviness. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Now there's some truth. There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, little children, it is the last time. And as you all have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Let me get this on the screen for you. It's 1 John chapter 2, and we're working out of verse 18. It is the last time. And as all you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now, there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. So we can look around and see what's going on in the world. And we can see by the, evidence, by the presence of these man-made doctrines, these, these doctrines that, that, that come from the Father, of lies, the author of confusion, we can tell that this is the last time because many antichrists are present and working. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. Verse 20. But ye, you all, when it says ye, it means you all. It's talking to a group. But you all have an unction from the Holy One. This is Holy Spirit. And you know all things. 
How do we know anything? Because the Holy Spirit guides us into right knowledge. Not Jwaj Kool or some ascended master. But you have an unction from the Holy One and you all know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you do know the truth. And that no lie is part of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? That Jesus is the Christ, not the Lord Maitreya. How do we know this is from Satan? Because, because of that. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? That Jesus is the Christ, not Lord Maitreya. Poor Benjamin Cream. But their gospel sounds right to a natural, to the natural man, to the man who spiritual things are foolishness to. This sounds right. This oneness doctrine, it sounds right. Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, born in 1831 was the co-founder of the Theosophical Society and a key player in the revival of the esoteric tradition in the West. Now, in Blavatsky, we're going to see where all of these New Age ideas emanate from. She was most certainly used for this purpose. Her name shows up absolutely everywhere. In the occult, in the New Age, all, all things esoteric, all roads lead to Blavatsky. Her writings provided foundational doctrines for the Theosophical Society and helped popularize and reimagine ancient occult ideas for the modern, scientifically thinking audience of the 19th century. This is a, spe this is a very specific time in history when she came along. Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society emerged during a time of great unsatisfied spiritual hunger in the wake of the scientific revolution and its accompanying hostility towards Christianity. Established biblical concepts, established biblical concepts of man's origin and special place within the God-ordered creation had been challenged and deposed among the intellectual elite. Nothing's changed. The Origin of Species in 1859 by Charles Darwin proposed the theory of evolution based on natural selection. It struck a seemingly fatal blow to the credibility and authority of the biblical account of the origin of humanity. This new purely materialistic paradigm of life had created an unbridgeable chasm between science and Christianity in the West. Blavatsky was able to uh, adapt ancient Neoplatonic creation myths and blend them with Eastern religious ideas to offer the spirituality, the spiritually thirsty, a new cocktail to satisfy their need for meaning and purpose. Okay, so Blavatsky was able to adapt ancient Neoplatonic creation myths and blend them. This is syncretism. When you take many religious ideas and blend them together in one practice, that is syncretism. And so this is uh, in the in the seventeen hundreds. We had the Age of Reason. Thomas Paine you know, wrote about the dawning of the age of reason. Blavatsky seems to be a player who reiterated that idea. A new, new age of reason where man, man is the God. Where Thomas Paine wrote about 
a universalist, a deistic idea where th there was a, possibly a creator God who was not interested in his creation. He was vacant, not present, an absent God. The new version, Blavatsky has created, is this is an age of reason where God has moved inside of man now. Man has all the power. Blavatsky spent several years living with her grandparents during the early 1840s. It is said that during this period she first began to exhibit psychic powers. So at a very young age, 10, 11, 12 years old, psychic powers. Her grandmother's father was a man called Prince Pavel Dogurikov. He died in 1838, was an initiate of Rosicrucian Freemasonry in the 1770s. Right there, right there in the Age of Reason, the Thomas Paine version of the Age of Reason. He had amassed a large occult library, which Blavatsky would spend her days lost in. She was particularly inspired by Freemasonry, with its foundation of esoteric wisdom motivating the world wide web of secret societies and dedicated to transforming the world. Now let's read, let's look at that sentence again. What is it that Freemasonry is dedicated to? To transforming the world. When you study Rosicrucianism and Jewish mysticism, and you find out very quickly from being involved with these traditions, with Western esotericism, you find out Freemasons don't have any secrets. The idea that everyone thinks they have secrets is what gives them their mystical energy in the world. They don't actually have any secrets. Everything right there. Yes, I, I know this doesn't. People who have seen maybe seen this book before. I, I'm yes, it doesn't tell us everything, but it it's a textbook for sure. There are no secrets in Freemasonry. That is a legend. And because everyone believes it, it gives them, it gives them a certain amount of authority and, and, and power, a certain sort of dark respect, which makes it possible for them to achieve their goal of transforming the world. Have you met anyone in the so-called truth movement who is not aware that, that, that the Freemasons are trying to transform the world to their image, to what they would like for it to look like? Since we're on YouTube, it would be difficult to comment very deeply about this, but many of these news stories that we see today, right? where certain things happen, many people are injured in certain specific ways, and there's a certain amount of, of, of energy, of weird compassion, tales of heroism coming through the news, bombarding your brain. That, that is the Freemasons. At age 18, in 1849, Blavatsky married, but the marriage only lasted three months. After leaving her husband, she began her 25-year pilgrimage around the world, where she encountered various gurus and occultists in her search for the esoteric secrets of the ancients. Early travels took her to Greece, Eastern Europe, and Egypt. One thing that's very important to understand about Freemasonry is that its its symbols are almost completely Egyptian. Pagan Egypt. Uh, before heading to Paris and London during the summer of 1850, uh, the teachings that Blavatsky claimed to have received throughout her wanderings became the basis for the doctrines of the Theosophical Society she later founded. Uh, she claimed to have, her f uh, to have first met her master, quote-unquote master, spiritual being, in Hyde Park during her time in London. 
This tall Hindu man, as she described him, convinced her that she had a critical mission ahead of her. She was determined to fulfill his prophecy. But her master insisted that she must first journey to Tibet, where she would receive the required training. Blavatsky's determination to reach Tibet was initially thwarted. After visiting the Americas, she attempted to enter uh, Tibet through Nepal in 1852, but was unable to enter until a later visit in 1856. Blavatsky's wanderings continued throughout Is India, Kashmir, Burma, and Europe before returning home to Russia in 1858. Her sister, Vera Petrovna, Dzelohovsky documented and described Helena's various abilities, including telepathy and telekinesis, psychic, uh, channeling, maybe being able to hear other people's thoughts, telepathy and telekinesis, being able to move things around, being able to affect action at a distance. Her sister also said Blavatsky had claimed to have the ability to mediate between humans and beings beyond the earthly realm. In, in, in around uh, 1865, Blavatsky resumed her travels visiting Italy, Eastern Europe, Egypt, and uh, Persia, which is Iran today. Her friendship with the revolutionary uh, Agadir Metrovich as a, mem uh, a member of the Italian society known as the Carbonari uh, brought her into contact with the organization whose membership included the Giuseppe Mazzini. You might have heard that name before. Giuseppe Mazzini is the man who Albert Pike is reported, purported to have written letters, had, had uh, letters written. He wrote letters to Giuseppe Mazzini explaining that there would be a World War I, a World War II, and a World War III. So the legend of the World War prophecies. Now, whether or not that's true, it's, it's not clear. It's hard, it's hard to pin these things down. It's a it's it's an old canard in the truth community though that you know that uh, that he predicted the world wars that Albert Pike in his letters to Giuseppe Mazzini predicted all the world wars whether or not those letters are real nobody knows it doesn't it doesn't matter it doesn't matter in what in, in any way it doesn't matter at all. It's of no consequence. But it is important that that name here shows up with Blavatsky at this time. So Blavatsky left Italy in 1868 for Constantinople. We know it as Istanbul. Summoned by her master. Together with Master Morya, as she referred to him, they traveled through India and into Tibet. Here she met another master known as Kut Humi or K.H., that's what Alice Bailey called him, an associate of Master Moya. So you see we have the same entities working with Bailey and Blavatsky at different times. At least the same names. Blavatsky was finally ready to be taken on as their disciple and relished the opportunity to finally be initiated into the ancient wisdom she longed for. The two masters were permitted full access to the Tibetan monastery and all of its sacred Buddhist literature was shared with Blavatsky, who remained in the Himalayas until 1870. Blavatsky considers this time as being the most critical period of her preparation to bring spiritual enlightenment to the West. Spiritual enlightenment to the West. This is the origin of modern-day Eastern philosophy in the West. Hinduism, yoga, all of these Eastern traditions found their way here and into our society and into our common consciousness through this conduit. 
Theosophical Society, Blavatsky Bailey, et al. Other masters would initiate her into the occult mysteries of the Greeks, the Copts, C-O-P-T-S, and Druze. During her, early, during her stay in Cairo, Blavatsky founded the Societe Spirite, the Spirit Society, essentially. This society seemed to have a dual agenda. The first was a public program dedicated... Now listen to this. If you know anything about... Freemasonry or esoteric traditions, there is always one thing that the public sees, which is the exoteric. And then there's the other piece that's only for the initiated, which is the esoteric. There's always two things going on at once. Jesus Christ said, I have done nothing in secret. I've done nothing in secret. That's what your Lord and Savior says. I have done nothing in secret. That's the truth, the word of God. That's why he is a being worthy of your worship. The first part of this dual agenda was a public program dedicated to the investigation of occult phenomena inspired by the spiritualist trend which had become popular in America. The second goal of the society, far more important to Blavatsky and the initiates, involved the practice of a highly of highly secretive occult rituals. These may well have resembled those practiced during the founding of the Theosophical Society by April uh, uh, Let's see, Master Moria, that is Master Moria, that is M-O-R-Y-A, Master Moria instructed Blavatsky to travel to the United States in 1873. Until this point, the accounts of Blavatsky's life are difficult to corroborate. Because one would, is dependent upon Blavatsky's own opinion of her travels. But now, at this point, we have Paul Johnson, who has carried out extensive, controversial, but extensive research on Blavatsky, concluded that Master Moria was not actually a real person, which was already stated, but rather a personification of a concept. This may have been inspired by the Freemasonic and Rosicrucian idea of invisible adepts secretly working for the evolution of humanity. And as I told you, I can tell you now, that is the doctrine of Rosicrucianism. To work, to be at one with those spirits, who, if you understand and live by God's word, you understand that those are the minion spirits of Satan, those that he, the one-third of the angels that he pulled out of heaven when he fell to the planet. When he fell to earth, those are the spirits that you're working with. They're happy to work for you, but it's going to cost you. The problem is, they don't tell you what it's going to cost you. If you want to follow Jesus Christ, if you want salvation, it's a free gift. It's a free gift. It'll cost you everything. If you're in love with the world, following Jesus Christ will cost you everything. But it's a free gift. And you know it. You know what it is. These characters, these invisible adepts, deception is their purpose to take anyone who might find and follow Jesus and distract them and deceive them out of that into their path. There is a war. The great controversy that exists on the planet is the war between God and Satan. Which side will you choose? And if you say you don't believe you're not going to choose either side, you still chose, and you chose poorly.
Okay, so Blavatsky comes to the United States, and she was very excited. Lots of anticipation when she came to the United States. She said, as a quote from her, she said, she had feelings not unlike those of a Mohammedan approaching the birthplace of his prophet. So she was very excited about coming to the United States. Spiritualist activity was thriving in, 18, in 1870s American cities. And it didn't take long for Blavatsky to meet like-minded people. In the 1870s, around this time in the United States, something was happening called the Spiritualist Movement, uh, the Fox Sisters. Let's pull up some Fox Sisters here. Are a couple prominent names that are at the right at the right at the beginning, right on the leading edge of the Spiritualist Movement. There they are, very happy-looking young ladies. And they were reported to have made contact with beings beyond the physical realm and could manifest rappings, you know, tappings on the wall at will. You know, they could, it's not very, you know, it's not very impressive that that spirit can, can, can you know, can, Tap on the wall. Is that it? That's 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 impressive. Jesus got out of the boat and walked on the Sea of Galilee and told Peter to come to me. And Peter got out of the boat and walked toward Jesus. And as long as Peter had his eyes on Jesus, he walked on the water too. And as soon as Peter realized, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, and looked and took his eyes off Jesus, he went down, went straight down. That'll preach right there. That'll preach. But anyway, so at the time, this is what's interesting about the time that Blavatsky came to the United States was when this spiritualist movement was going on. The Fox sisters were well known for what they could produce in their homes, this rapping and in 1874s, possibly her most significant meeting occurred with a New York lawyer named Henry Steele Olcott. And Olcott had been investigating another spiritual phenomenon in New York, or in uh, actually a phenomenon in uh, Chittenden, Vermont, uh, where there were reports of phantom forms appearing at the Eddie Brothers' home. And that's another one. The Fox, the Fox sisters, and the Eddie Brothers. This is important because this is the beginning of the spiritualist movement in the United States. As Blavatsky arrives with her new theosophical ideas, this, this new age of reason thing that she's got going, this is what's happening in the United States. These are the Eddie Brothers. The home. They were pretty popular. They, people would come from all over the country to visit And watch tables be turned over. I've experienced this side of reality. And while it's while it's interesting that a table would be tipped over, or a being would manifest in a holographic kind of way right in front of you, I want to remind you that the one we worship created the universe with a word. So this stuff, it's not impressive. It's just not impressive. The one we worship took up the dust of the earth, formed it, breathed into it, there was a living soul. A man, a woman, was created. So don't be overwhelmed and taken aback by things such as door slamming, the Ouija board jumping around, or the table jump moving, or 
and, and don't be don't be taken away in excitement if your if your dead uncle walks in the living room. Spooky as it might be, it's not impressive. It's not impressive when you think about there is one who created all, everything. And he created you. And he gave us a savior, a lifeline out of the turmoil. So, 1870s, Blavatsky comes to the United States. Olcott and Blavatsky would go on to co-found the Theosophical Society after concluding that the American spiritualist movement lacked the depth that uh, she associated with occultism and its ancient wisdom. So, just like I said, you know, it's spiritualism is entertaining, but even Blavatsky wasn't that impressed with it. She saw something that could actually change the way people thought, the way people related to one another, the way people thought about the Creator. Blavatsky had been conferring with spirit beings, who she identified as masters. These are the ascended masters, once again during her flirtation with the American spiritualist movement, but it was not until she rejected it that she began to produce uh, her own spiritual doctrines. She first began to make these ideas public in her articles, which were written for the Boston-based Spiritual Scientist magazine. Blavatsky expounded on the various manifestations of the occult throughout the ages, drawing from her studies of people like Eliphas Levi. I mean, every occultist, every mason, every mystic knows, every magician knows Eliphas Levi. This gave her articles a tremendous amount of depth when compared to the relatively trivial psychic messages that were being circulated throughout the spiritualist circles in America. So by September of 1875, after a lecture by Freemasonic Kabbalist George Henry Felt, Olcott proposed that a society should be founded for the study of the occult. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing the thread. Here's the Freemasonic, the Kabbalistic influence in the Theosophical Society, the Freemasonic, the Kabbalistic influence on the New Age movement, the new spirituality, the new thought movement, has its origins in Freemasonry, Kabbalism, Occultism, Rosicrucianism, Western esoteric magical traditions. It's not of God and has nothing to do with Christianity Yet, we see it in the church in the form of books like The Shack, uh, books written by Neil Donald Walsh, all finding their way into Christian libraries. Satan is a wily adversary, and he walks about like a roaring lion, seeing who he may devour. And If you're not founded in the truth of God's word, it might be you. Blavatsky's first major work called Isis Unveiled, and this Isis specifically referring to the Egyptian form, the goddess. This is where the goddess worship emanates from in the modern New Age movement. This was uh, Isis Unveiled was published uh, in 1877 while she was living in New York. A 1,268-page work that was divided into two volumes. First volume was called The Infallibility of Modern Science and the second volume called Theology. Blavatsky wrote uh, wrote in the preface that Isis Unveiled is a plea for the recognition of the hermetic philosophy, the anciently universal wisdom religion, as the only possible key to the absolute in science and theology. 
So she's appealing to the Hermetic tradition, which is uh, known today as a Rosicrucian tradition. It's all the same. It's all the same. They're just variations of the same theme. Blavatsky, highlighting what she believed to be similarities between Christianity and Eastern religions, argues that they all share the same common ancestor, which she refers to as the wisdom religion. So she's, she's making the point that Christianity, the Word of God, it somehow, somehow comes from, from ancient wisdom religions. It comes from the same place that Buddhism came from, in other words. This is what she learned in her travels. So we see how deception can lead someone into ideas that have no foundation. So Blavatsky and Olcott left New York in 1879. The same year, the pair published the first copy of the Theosophical Society's monthly magazine called The Theosophist. According to Olcott's diary, this is the year that Blavatsky would begin writing what many consider to be her greatest work, called The Secret Doctrine. And if you're any kind of a cultist, you've read The Secret Doctrine. That is, that is, that is the one. That is the Bible of the occult. If you're a Mason... If you're above the Blue Lodge, let's above the Blue Lodge. If you're a mystic of some kind, if you claim to be any sort of magician other than, you know, a Harry Potter style, you know the secret doctrine. In the build up to its publication, the magazine the magazine Lucifer was established in eighteen eighty seven. By this time Blavatsky had settled in London where The Secret Doctrine was published. This was another two-volume work dealing with cosmogenesis, or the origin of creation of the universe, and anthro, anthropogenesis, or creation, origins of human beings. Blavatsky first discussed the nature of reality, both material and spiritual. In the second volume, Blavatsky focused on the origins and destiny destiny of humanity. She taught that there are seven root races. Now, she's talking about spiritual root races, not necessarily in the, the, the way we think of races today. She's talking about root races, spiritual root races that are evolving, and that the Anglo-Saxons belong to the fifth spiritual root race. She also expanded upon her concept of cosmic hierarchy of superintelligent beings responsible for overseeing and guiding the evolution of the universe. That is the essential understanding of this new age re movement today. The new spirituality, the new gospel stands on this idea that there are beings that exist outside of our realm of perception and we know they are. They're just they're just not they're just not there for good. They're not there to help us. They're there to destroy you. You're created by God. These who rebelled against God and were cast out of heaven are here to destroy you if they can. If you'll give them the authority, they will happily seduce you and destroy you. That's their job. That's what they're here to do. Nothing else. They help you win the lottery. Big deal. They're going to kill you. They're going to destroy you. You're going to succumb to the second death. And so Blavatsky began exhibiting symptoms of influenza in April of 1891 and eventually died in May of 1891. There were many allegations of fraud and plagiarism that plagued her, her, uh, her work, as well as lawsuits that were brought against Blavatsky. Her ability to synthesize all that said, 
Blavatsky's ability to synthesize and eloquently articulate the knowledge that she passionately believed would bring about the evolution of humanity was the main reason over 100 notices appeared in the British press to commemorate her death. She was extremely popular in Britain, home of Charles Darwin. Uh, the ancient wisdom of her masters that she believed was her destiny to communicate to humanity has continued to provide the foundation for the modern New Age movement, the New Spirituality movement, the New Thought movement. It's the same game by whatever name you choose. And once again, sources for these articles are in the description. And I encourage everyone to check it out because they, these folks have done a good job in, in giving a, a solid background of who these characters are. And what I'm here to do is synthesize as much material as I can and use my own experience to, one, keep Jesus Christ central and pray for, pray for God to glorify His name through me as I work for Him. My life is committed and devoted to that purpose, to serving the one who created me from now on until he takes me away from here. And in my journey, what I intend to do is give as much information as I possibly can about the experience that I've had coming out of these systems, back into a saving knowledge of my Savior, Jesus Christ, and I want to lead as many people, whether they're in the New Age movement or not, out of it and back to Jesus Christ. Likewise, I have an important message for those who are in the church, in the body of Christ, and who have found it, who have found these elements to be a part of their systems of worship today, because it's there. It's in there. It's been confused, confused together. So here's the uh, Theosophical Society's website. What is Theosophy? I think we've probably got a good idea. So you can see the uh, confusion of religions here. Uh, theosophy says here on the About section, We humans know that we could be much more than we ordinarily are. But what is this? What potential do we have that we could develop more fully? And who could tell us what this potential is? They claim that there is a body of knowledge that answers these questions. It provides theory, practice, and techniques that enable us to free ourselves from the limitations of ordinary life and achieve greater happiness, wisdom, and peace. They say peace. They mean war. This knowledge has gone by many names. The ancient wisdom, the perennial philosophy, the wisdom tradition. We know it. We know it as the first lie Satan told in the garden. What was that lie? Let's end right here on this. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle. Let me get you up here on the screen. There we go. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, 
You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So the serpent has already, the first thing the serpent said was, Yea, has God said? Questioning the word of God, questioning what the Creator has said. Let's keep in mind, this is the one who was cast out of heaven because his pride overtook him, and he wanted God's seat. So sin was found in him, and he was cast out of heaven. He was a created being. God made Lucifer the most beautiful of the host. But he coveted God's seat, God's throne. He wanted God's job. He wanted to, to have control over all. And that's the lie he still tells today. You can have control over all. Just listen to me. So he questions God, God's word. And the woman answers and tells him, what God has said. And then the serpent comes back and says to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It's the same lie. What the Theosophical Society stands for, what the New Age movement, the new spirituality, this new gospel, what they're pushing is this idea that you'll not surely die, that your, your soul is eternal. Your soul existed before you were born. You are eternal is what they're trying to teach you. That's what Satan said. You shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day you eat of the fruit, in the day you accept this idol, look at the fruit of the tree as an idol. On the day that you accept this idol, and you listen to me, and you accept the idol, your eyes shall be opened and you will see everything and you will know the truth. You will know the ancient wisdom. Satan lies and said, God doesn't want you to eat this fruit because if you do, you'll know all your power. It's the same thing that, the, that, that these new age gurus are teaching today. That you can know all the truths. You can manifest your reality you can live forever. You know, spiritual realm, all of this, it's, it's Satan's lie. Just plainly state, it's Satan's lie from start to finish. And that's all I have for you tonight. And uh, I want to say God bless you all. Share this information. Like this. Subscribe. Do all that stuff. But whatever you do, share the information with people. If you see folks in church, uh, if you see people reading the book, The Shack, I'll, do, I'll talk about that book here too. We'll get to it eventually. But we need to understand that our body of Christ is being infiltrated by Satan. He's lying and telling us things today that sound like the gospel, and they're not. They're confusing Christianity with paganism, and we need to be aware of it. God bless you all. Thank you. Subscribe, like, hit the bell, do all that stuff. But whatever you do, Pray. Pray for people. Pray for those who are deceived. Pray for your brothers and sisters in the churches. Share the information. God bless you.